If you got a Bible, if you think you're winded, <laughs> just saying. If you got a Bible, turn with me to John chapter 16. I'm going to continue on just ask. Say with me, just ask. Just ask. John chapter 16, verse 23. John 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 is the final words of Jesus as he finishes his ministry and as he's headed to the cross. And, uh, and uh, so he's talking to these people that are surrounding him and he's talking about the future and he's making certain statements to them. And, and he makes this statement in John 16, 23, in that day. In. Say, in that day. In that. Not today, but in, in that day. It's, it's been like this. This is the way we've been operating. But in that day, say, in that day. It's going to be different in that day. It's going to be something. In that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give to you. I could stop right there. I could take that verse and just go for about an hour. And, and he said, well, up till this point, it's been like this. I've been blessing your bread and multiplying your fish, and I, I've been healing. But he said, we've been living in this time over here. But he said, after I'm crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended, and sent the Holy Spirit, when I'm done with what I came to do, it'll be a different day. Amen. He's saying, not today, but in about three and a half days, it'll be a different day. After I've died for your sins, after I've been resurrected, after I've gone to the Father and sent the Spirit, you just have to ask in my name. Say with me, in that day. In that day. Look at your neighbor and say, today, today. is that day. Jesus has already died for sins. He's already been resurrected. He's already arisen sitting on a throne. And he sent himself back to you in the form of a spirit. Say, in that day. Say, today. Most people have no idea what time it is. They're waiting until they die and go to heaven. I just want you to know, when you're in heaven, you won't need a hamburger. When you're in heaven, you won't need help here. You'll be in heaven. But in that day, until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be made full. Say, ask, and you'll be happy. Ask. You know, I see joyless people all the time, and it's because they're prayerless. Prayerful people have joyful lives. So, oh. these things I've spoken to you in a figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in a figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, say, in that day. Amen. Say, today's that day. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, today. Amen. Ask in my name and I will do I do not say that to you that I shall pray to the Father for you for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and I and have believed that I have come forth from God say the Father loves me Oh my God. I can ask the Father directly, personally, one-on-one, -on -one, intimately, shamelessly. I can go to Daddy and I can ask Daddy for myself because He's not just the Father of Jesus. He's our Father who lives in heaven. And I can go directly to the Father and go, Dad! I was preaching in first service and Andy reminded me that his children always walking up to him going, Dad, Dad, Dad. Dad, and he said, if I don't answer them, they just get louder. Dad, Dad, oh, come on, Mom, you know the same, Mom, 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 Mom. I can remember when Stephen was about, I don't know, eight or nine, and he was going, Mom, 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 and he went over and he took her face and he turned her face to his and said, listen to me. <laughs> See, children get this, ask and keep on asking. Yes. Just keep on asking. I, I got this little quote. Prayer will never really change our lives as long as we re let it remain on the surface. As long as prayer is a surface issue, as long as it is nothing more than a thousand other things, it won't change your life. Yeah. See, prayer has to become the main thing, the only thing, the one thing necessary. It has to be the purpose and the re reason for your life. It has to become the breathing of your life. I, I sat in the presence of Francis not long ago and people were firing questions about well, what about this and what about this and what about this and in the world in there, what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do this? And he stops and he pauses. He says, I think we underestimate the power of prayer. Woo! You do understand that the church holds all the power. Yes. Nobody else holds all the power. The church holds all the power. The church can pray. And when the church prays, it supersedes what anybody else is doing. When the church begins to re realize the power that they have, the gift that is theirs, 
the privilege, the responsibility of prayer. They can, they can change things that are happening. They can prevent things from happening. They can overcome things that have already happened. We, we need to understand that when we ask, we reveal the relationship. When, when, when a child calls dad, dad, it reveals the relationship, father, son. All you got to do is ask, and you make the relationship known. What would destroy the religion of this moment is when we would live more in the relationship rather than the religion. You do understand that religious people, and to be religious means a return to bondage. Go look it up in the Webster's Dictionary. If you're a religious person, you've returned to bondage. Because religious people are always interpreting what they must do in order to be presented in front of God. No, spiritual people that follow God in a relational way are not focused on what they do, but on what He has done. It is finished. You see, Christians need to ask a question, why don't we pray? We need to ask ourselves, what is the reason we don't pray? And I would say to you, one of the reasons, because we don't understand how God operates through man. Romans chapter 5, verse 17 says, if by one man's offense or trespass, death reigned or ruled through that one, much more those who have received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one. Say with me, Adam messed it up. I mean, come on, we understand that Adam gave up his right to walk with God and talk with God. He, he, he stopped depending on God and did it for himself. Adam committed high treason and listened to the words of the devil and had suspicion about the goodness of God. Adam failed. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, came and lived among us, and he did not fail. Am I making any sense? And when we were born as this Adam, death ruled and reigned. But when Jesus came, and after his death, burial, and resurrection, and he sent his spirit into our hearts, all of a sudden we're redeemed and restored, and we now are what God originally attended. How many of you are born again? I'm not ashamed of being born again. I ask that question. Some people go, well, what do you mean? I mean, you died, and now he lives. That's what I mean. I mean, you surrendered your life, and now you live his life. It's pretty simple. You surrendered and said, not my way, but your way. It's pretty simple. I can't do this. Jesus is doing this. It's pretty simple. Unless you believe and are born again. How many are born again? So you've received the gift of grace, and you're in right standing not because of what you did, but because of what he's done, right? See, now then you're restored to the original idea that God had when he created you. And the original idea when God created you is found in Genesis chapter 1. Let us, that's interesting, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, us, this communion of three, us make man in our image and we shall give him dominion. Say dominion. Very simply put, in Oki language, it means control. In other words, we created all this stuff down here, and we're going to make one like us, and the one like us will control this stuff we've made. Hmm. Touch your neighbor and say, a man in right standing, by grace, is in control. See, the sovereign God gave his sovereign will to you. In other words, we can't blame anybody but our... Ooh, if we didn't put, if we didn't make the bed, we go home, it ain't made. If we didn't put the chicken in the, in the crock pot, we go home, it's still in the freezer. I, I mean, say it with me, it's your choice. I, I mean, humanity just wants to keep living after the death, burial, and resurrection, like K, Sarah, Sarah. Look, Doris wasn't that great. It... it <laughs> See, if we don't understand that God is working through his creation, he's working through you and I. The psalmist writes this, what is man that thou art mindful of him, the son of man that thou would visit him? For you made him slightly lower than the angels, you crowned him with glory and honor. But look at this verse, you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. Say with me, he made us to have dominion over the works of the hands of God. You put all things under his feet. Now, I didn't say it. Don't get mad at me. I'm just preaching the Bible. I had somebody the other day say, do you preach the Bible? And I thought, duh. 
Or, I'm serious. I thought, duh, I gave you more verses. And then I had preachers tell me, you used too many verses. <laughs> duh. I thought both were. Uh, anyway, say with me, have dominion over the works of his hand. I mean, in other words, God said, I'm going to run this planet through your life. And so this Adam and this Adam say much more now that the death, but in that day, after Jesus has redeemed, shed his blood, risen, say in that day. And then, then he looks at them in the 14th chapter. John says, verily, verily, I say unto you that he who believeth on me, the works that I do, greater things will he do. Say greater, just greater. Say whatever he did, we're going to do great, great. Say great, they great. What he's really saying is, I, I, I am the firstborn of a new race, but now you're, you're also born into that new race. This is a new Christian should be a new kind of human. Christians should be a new kind of a human being. They should be the kind that are born again, filled with the Spirit, and are doing great things. Even greater, I mean, say great things. Look at your neighbor, say great things are in store for you. You're going to do. How do you have this much passion, Lord? Well, today's a greater day than yesterday, and tomorrow's going to be an even greater day because I'm not worried about my future. I know that it's great. Uh, five people went, Woo! have you seen my life? <laughs> well, never mind. Pray. <laughs> Say greater things. See, we, we, why don't people pray? Well, we have, this, we have this idea that maybe it's somebody else's responsibility, but I have been given the privilege to talk to God. I've been given the privilege to speak for God. I've been given uh, that day. Say that day. Today. Say today. You could start praying today. Today you could begin to realize that you've been. Hmm, James echoes this when he says you have not because you. Just ask. Uh, dad. Hey, dad. Hey, dad. Dad. See, I don't think we even know what ask means. I don't think we even understand it. Why don't people ask? I'm going to give you 10 things. Are you ready? I got 21 minutes. I'm telling you, I, I'm a fast talker. I can talk up to 1,500 words a minute. 1,500 words a minute. That's why when people start telling me a story, my eyes cross over. Get to the point. Speed it up. There's sometimes some of you start talking to me, and I'm thinking, I got 12 other people to talk to this morning. I ain't got an hour. I love you. I love you. I love you. If you want that much time, make an appointment. I'll see you. But this morning, I'm trying to touch about 400 people. Can I? Can, please? So if I can speak up to 1,500 words a minute, I need you to turn up your ears and hear a little faster. Number one people, what we don't ask is because we're afraid. We're afraid. We have this unbelief. We, we've been disappointed so many times. Isaiah the prophet shows up to Asa in the seventh chapter, and he said, just ask the Lord anything. The prophet in the Old Testament said, just ask me anything. And the king went, I ain't asking him nothing. I'm not putting him to a test. See, there's people that are afraid to put God on the line in their lives. They're afraid. They're afraid because when they do, they put it all out there, and they're afraid to do it. And right there, two verses later, he said, Behold, I'll give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and be born in his name. Listen, God is wanting to share with you the greatest thing in history. I ain't asking. I ain't asking for nothing. I want to tell you, people that don't ask for anything don't know Jesus. Because if you really know who Jesus is, you're asking him for eggs. You're asking him to keep the snakes out of the chicken coop. You're laying hands on the Oldsmobile going, Jesus, you need to keep that thing running. I mean, I was raised with people praying for the most. <laughs> I mean, but I, I've watched the tomatoes be. I mean, I've watched Grandma pray as she dropped that pumpkin seed in the ground and said, Jesus, make it big. And it's big. And she wasn't taking it to the fair. She was selling it. Oh, well. See, I, I think that people don't pray because they have no ima imagination, no paradigm in believing that God wants to move in our lives. The second reason people don't pray is because the culture has convinced you that it's crazy. The culture has come into your life and you have bought into the world's view rather than into God's view. You have a world view rather than a kingdom view. And you've been so disappointed that now you're just afraid to ask because after all, if you ask and it doesn't work, you know, so, so the people come into the culture and they're watching the world and they're watching this. I've had people tell me, you and it ain't never going to happen. Watch this, Bubba. Watch it. 
well, it ain't going to happen in my lifetime. How long are you going to live? Well, you know, 80 or 90, you missed the book. The book says you're going to live eternally. You will live to see what God said come to pass. Just because you ain't going to stand here doesn't mean you ain't going to see it. Say with me, I'm going to live forever. I'm going to see everything he said. Oh, well. Say, I, I it. Mm. Number one reason people don't ask is they're afraid. They don't believe. Number two is they've bought in the world of the culture and they're afraid of being disappointed. Number three, listen, let me tell you, when you pray, you're a gambler. You're a gambler. When you pray, the minute you begin to pray and the rubber meets the road, you have thrown the dice down the table. You have pulled the slot. I was on a plane coming out of Miami and I had a very nice seat. It's the ones where you get on first and they're extra wide and a very nice seat. And I get on and I sit down. I got my collar on. And I like traveling in my collar. Like I get on, you get first choice. When you, never mind. Uh, <laughs> listen, I'll take what I can get. You just sit there. I, but anyway, I'm sitting there on, on this side and this guy gets in and he's got two phones going. He is yakking and he's swearing and he's doing all this stuff. And, and finally the plane takes off and he can't talk on the phone and he's just drizzled with sweat and his thousand dollar canali suit and his tie is all and i'm sitting there thinking you're in first class and not even enjoying it and, and i said buddy what's the matter he goes man he said i make slot machines i said you do what he said i build slot machines he said i build the kind of slot machines that you can take your debit card and put it right in there and you don't have to go get any quarters and you just man you know how many people go broke because they just use all their debit thing and you make slot machines that use a debit and he goes and amazon went down I said, it did. And I remember walking to the plane and I couldn't get my thing to load them. And I, well, what's the matter with that? And I stepped up and they said, well, something's not working. And so the inter- and his slot machines worked off of Amazon's internet. And he said, I'm losing X number of dollars every 60 seconds. It's that down. I said, man, I'm sorry. And I'm actually going, thank you, Jesus. But anyway, <laughs> I, I, and, and so pretty soon after his third drink, he looks over me. He said, what do you do? I'm sitting in purple with a white thing and, and a cross this big. And he goes, what do you do? <laughs> Pretty observant. And, and I, thought, I thought at that moment, I'm not dealing with the sharpest tack in the drawer. And, and, and I thought, i got to have this answer. And, and he's asking. I said, I'm a gambler. <laughs> and then I had his attention. He said, you're a what? I said, man, I am a gambler. He said, what do you mean? I said, I have risked my life. I have risked the life of my children and my grandchildren. I've risked the life of every friend I know on Jesus Christ. There is no plan B. There is no plan C. I've thrown it all out there in the grace of God. If his death, burial, and resurrection doesn't give me life, I ain't going to get it. I said, you're trusting in money, but honey, I am trusting in Jesus. J-E-S-U-S. I'm a gambler. I'll win. Amen. I had his attention. Now, he never talked to me again. Uh, <laughs> but I guarantee you, he, he thinking about what I said. See, there's a verse in Acts that says, these are men who have gambled everything on Jesus. If you read it in the Greek, it says, these are men that have gambled. It says, these are the men that have turned the world upside down. If you keep looking there, these are men that have gambled. Listen, until you're willing to roll it all on a prayer, you don't know what prayer is. If you wait to pray in the last resort, you don't understand. I take all of this and I throw it out there. And there it is. Number four, the reason why people don't pray is it'll reveal you. If you really start praying, everybody will know how weak you are, how helpless you are, how vulnerable you are, that you can't do nothing on your own. All of a sudden, the fig leaves come off, and you're not the perfect Christian that goes to church a couple times a month and gives. You are now standing there in need of everything, and you look like a helpless, hopeless, weak, little child. Most people want to pray some kind of little form of prayer and then kind of move on or let somebody else pray rather than just letting the Spirit of God reveal. Oh, well. It's awfully revealing when you pray. I've revealed more about myself in prayer than... See, prayer makes known what's on the inside. When you pray, all of a sudden, what's in here comes out of here because you speak, you ask. And it's kind of like a cartoon character. Anybody watch cartoons, read cartoons in the newspaper? They're the best place to read them. I read cartoons in the newspaper. Because here I am standing here, and then there's a circle above my head, and it's got words in it. (laughs) 
And all of a sudden, what's in here in my heart comes out my mouth and the whole world knows what I'm thinking because I've spoke. See, the Bible says in Isaiah 55 verse 11 that the word comes out of his mouth and it doesn't return until it's accomplished, where unto it's sent. The first thing we know about this God that we follow is that he is a talking God and creates everything by his word. And he made us in his image so that we could speak. And when it comes up out of our heart and we speak, light happens. We were created to rule and reign in his place to speak his word. For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Most people are afraid to reveal their deepest, darkest, most holy desire because when you do it, it goes out and it's your speech. Do you understand? A dog doesn't talk, but a man in the image of God has the ability to speak. We underestimate the power of communicating with God because asking reveals our desires. It reveals you. It's authentic. It's the true self. It's humbling. It's surrendering. I take my place as the created in front of the creator and I make known. Number five, the reason why most people don't pray is because they don't really believe he's listening. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. For you must believe, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You got to believe he is. Is what? Here present now. I don't think I'm shouting up there. I think I'm talking to the God that's here and here and he's present. And when I, when, when I pray, I'm telling you, God is here. When I pray, I'm telling you, I believe in a God that speaks and listens and moves that I'm not alone, that he's with me. That's the kind of God I believe in. I don't believe in a Baptist, a Methodist, Episcopalian, a Pentecostal, a Roman Catholic. I don't believe in a God of dogma and doctrine. I believe a God who is alive for he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of the living and not the dead. And when I pray, I'm saying, I am talking to God. I'm not wishing or have a whim. I am speaking. And he's listening. Man. And when you listen to someone pray, you can tell the difference. Oh, I get to talk to the one that made me. I get to talk to the one that redeemed me. I get to talk to the one that's living on the inside of me. And he's going to talk back to me. I don't believe in some form. I believe in this presence, this reality. And I touch your neighbors. I believe he's right here. I, I, this is this. this I'm, I'm, I'm revealing my true self to the true him. And, and, oh, I'm asking. Number six. Why don't people pray? Because your words are cheap. Because your words are cheap. I hear people say stuff all the time. And then they go, "Well, I was just joking." They say for all time, they go, well, that's not what I meant. We live in a world today that you can just say any stupid thing you want to say. Well, that's not what I meant. You listen to me. He spoke the world into existence. Life and death is on the power of the tongue. You live by your word. Words matter. I teach my grandchildren that words matter. And I turn on the TV and they're telling me words don't matter. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Words matter. And if you cheapen your privilege to speak, then when you pray, it's cheap. Listen, we need to get integrity. We don't want to speak like the world speaks. We want to speak like redeemed, born again, spirit-filled people that honor the privilege that we have to speak grace, to speak life, to speak healing. And until we, oh my God, why don't people ask? Because they think words are cheap. I want to look at people sometimes and say, could you find a different word? Could you find a different word? You're going to be held accountable according to Jesus, justified or condemned by your words. Words matter. And they don't just matter when you start saying a prayer. They matter all the time. We're living in a world that thinks you can get away with just saying anything. No. I'm a preacher. I'm a representative of God. And I'm standing before you saying, get your words in line. Don't follow the world. Oh, notice how quiet it gets in here. Because we just want to run off. How many know the Bible says we are kings and priests? How many know the Bible says that? 
were kings and priests. I could take you into the book of Daniel where they tricked the king during Daniel's time into issuing a decree that threw Daniel into the lion's den. And the king said, I've spoken and I can't reverse it. I I could take you into the story of Esther where they tricked the king into making a decree about the Jews and the king said, I can't reverse it. See, kings and priests, you can't reverse their words. You get the choice. But if you understand that you're a king and that you have dominion and that you're ruling and reigning over the earth, you've got to choose your words carefully. Well, I didn't say it. I put it on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, now it never goes away. <laughs> now they just keep looking at that silly thing. I want to say somebody, sometimes the mic is on. Oh, well. Say with me, take care. I love, I, I don't go to many of them anymore. Words matter. I go to, go to prayer meetings. I've been to all kinds. I've been to those ones where you sit in a circle. Okay, you pray. And you can tell they don't know what to pray for. Well, could you pray for my Aunt Jane? I think she's in real trouble. And they tell you about Aunt Jane. And I looked at this lady one day. I said, have you prayed for Aunt Jane? She said, no, I hadn't prayed for Aunt Jane. I thought I'd wait till we get here. I went, if it isn't enough for you to pray for Aunt Jane, why am I praying for Aunt Jane? It's your Aunt Jane. Maybe you should have prayed for Aunt Jane before you ever got here. If you had prayed for Aunt Jane at home, maybe we could pray for... I love Pentecostals. They're the ones going, unspoken request. What the heck is an unspoken request? (laughs) Well, I don't want anybody else to know. Then you're not praying. You're gossiping. And I guarantee you, when you get to the foyer, you're telling everybody in the foyer what that unspoken request was. Was Four little old ladies went, what really was we praying for? (laughs) Focus! The, The Bible says that Jesus was moved with compassion. That word compassion means he loves that being, but he hates what the disease is doing. So he loves and hates all at the same time. And it's like your guts are churning. When he prayed, it was out of that heart. He wasn't going, on my prayer lessons, I got to play for Bob and Bill and Joe and John. (laughs) He went, no, 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 no. He was moved with this compassion and he was compelled. I hate praying with people that are mamby-pamby, just kind of playing. No! Most people don't pray because they don't understand the power of God. (sighs) Number seven, they ain't got a clue what they want. What do you want? I don't know. What do you want? Well, I don't know what I want. I mean, God showed up to Solomon, the son of King David, and said, what do you want? Blank check. Anything you want, Solomon, I'll give to you. Blank check. What do you? I've prayed this prayer all of my life. What do you want, Solomon? Solomon says, I want to hear your voice. I want to know your wisdom. I want to understand what you would do if you were in my spot. I want to understand how to lead your people. I want to understand how to live in this place. I want to understand how to build this temple that my dad had saved up for. I want to know what to do and when to do it and how to do it. I want to walk as you would walk. That's what I want. You got to know what you want. Bartimaeus, what do you want? Duh. Duh. Uh, 38 years that man had laid by that pool. Jesus steps over. Everybody else goes to the dude that's been sick 38 years. said, do you even want to be made well? I like that. I think he was sarcastic. Yeah, you've been laying here for 38 years. Why didn't you stay by the pool and just roll in? I mean, after 15 years, you could understand, don't get too far away. Just stay real close to the... Do you... Listen, I'm not being mean, but I am telling you, there's some people that don't want to be made well. They like the attention. They don't, they don't, Pete, we can pray for them all day long. They just say, yeah, but then we couldn't call and say, I couldn't get out of bed. I had not like, come to church, but I was too sad. <laughs> Moving on. There's a story in the leper, and the leper comes to Jesus and if you will, you could heal me. If you read it in the Greek and get the tone and the tenor of how Jesus responds, he goes, if I will, what are you talking about? If I will, of course I will. This is not about my will. This is about, do you want to? 
See, I'm going to preach on this next Sunday, if it be God's will. Most people get all hung up on, what's the will of God? <laughs> you know, that was prayed one time, and he was headed to a cross. See, do I go commit suicide or not? <laughs> you better ask if it's God's will. If it being God, how would I know if it's God's will? I love going to foreign countries, because those people over there never stopped to ask that. I love new Christians. They never stop to ask it. They pray for the most absurd things. They just, ah! I asked one guy in uh, uh, South Africa one time, I said, how did you know to pray that prayer? How did you know that was the will of God? He said, I asked the Father, and he told me. I went, Shazam! If you don't know what to pray for, just ask. God, what do you want me to pray for? Uh, most people don't pray because, well, I don't know whether it's God's will. If it... That's silly to me. I mean, the first thing God says is ask, ask, say ask. I think I'll just ask what he wants me to pray. You know, here's the crazy thing. I, I am spirit filled. I do believe you need to know God, the spirit. And the Bible says <laughs> that when you don't know what to pray, the spirit prays. So when you don't know what the will is, can I tell you the spirit that lives inside of you does know what to pray. You could just trust the spirit that's on the inside. You might find yourself praying stuff going, I didn't know that. That prayer's not, I, most of the time when I pray anything that's any good, I'm going, I didn't know to pray for that. I, a lot of times you'll come down here and I'll lay hands on you and I'll, I'll pray for you and you'll go, oh, that's a prophetic word. And I'm thinking, no, that's just Jesus. <laughs> yeah, never mind. I better, I better. Number nine, why don't people pray? Well, because they don't want to submit. They really don't want to submit and let the Spirit have its way in their life. They, 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 they really, you know, they, 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 the word faith is the word trust. In the Hebrew, to trust means to fall face forward without reaching for something to hold you up. To, to, to trust means to fall face forward and not reach for something to hold you up. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not to thy own understanding. Most people are trying to stay up by listening to their own rational understanding. No, to trust God is just to fall in it and say, God, you, you got this. I used to do that fall on the floor. I don't do that anymore. You should have been here earlier. Uh, it was interesting. Hmm. Let me tell you, mo most people are expecting a jolt. I got 60 seconds. Most people are expect. <laughs> Thanks for tolerating me. If you hadn't sang that song again, I'd be on time. Uh, <laughs> uh, most people are looking for a jolting response to their prayer. Now, there are. There are events that are... But can I tell you that I have realized 90% of the time I look over my shoulder and it was a process and God was answering my prayer incrementally, a little at a time. And, and yeah, there are jolts, but generally God was answering it and I forgot to be thankful. Most people don't ask anymore because they don't get the jolt. Pentecostals are the worst. They want the goosebump. Well, I want something to happen. Jump. Bring your body as a living sacrifice. Go ahead. I I'm telling you, years ago, I used to come in here, and before they ever started singing, I'd be going, what was I doing? I was telling my body, look, I don't care. You're not, they can say whatever they want to. I'm here because I'm going to give everything I got. Some of you need to tap a toe. You have faith without works is dead. Worship, worship will move you. It's, a, it's okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish with two stories. You remember the story in Luke chapter 18 where it says the persistent woman came to the unjust judge wanting justice. Duh. If I was wanting justice, I wouldn't go to an unjust judge. But the Bible says, Jesus tells the story, a persistent woman came to an unjust judge and asked for justice. And because she kept pestering him, <laughs> the unjust judge gave her what she wanted. Remember that story? And, and then Jesus tells the story, and he goes, but the real question is, will we, I find faith? And he tells the story about how she got what she was asking for because she was pestering. But then he says, but there was no faith in there. It was just pestering. Just pestering. Pestering prayers. Just pestering. Just pestering. Pestering. 
And then he tells the story about blind Bartimaeus, who, who recognizes that Jesus has come to town. And he starts screaming, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he grew louder. And I've looked at those stories all my life and thought, now what's the difference between this pestering woman and this persistent, shameless blind man? See, she's pestering a system, but there's no faith. He is prophesying to Jesus. Prophesying to Jesus. Have mercy. This man recognized the relationship that God had with him. And he prophetically prayed like it was done. Mercy. You have not because you ask not, because most of your asking is pestering. You haven't recognized the relationship that God is good, that his mercy endureth forever, that he has chosen you, redeemed you, And then when you begin to ask him, your prayers are determined by who he is. (laughs) You need to quit moving out of a pestering, demanding justice. And move into this reality where you're prophesying his goodness is in your life. Now that's prayer. See, by the time you get here, you can't be wondering, well, if it's his will. I'll preach on that next Sunday. Come back. I got to wrap this up. I preached on this for two Sundays. I'm going to preach on it again. Now, you, you can say, hey, that was pretty good. Or you can pick up one of the little pieces of paper out there in the lobby. And it does nothing but show you the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. And then it asks you about four questions. Who are you praying for? What are you praying for? What are you expecting? What are you grateful to? See, I'm trying to get you to develop a habit of asking the Lord. I'm not trying to get you to be a pest. I'm trying to get you to live in relationship. And I'm here to tell you that we have surrendered control of the world because we haven't asked God to send his kingdom into our lives. The church, the church could change the world. I'm not asking the church to change governments. I'm asking Jesus to change me. I'm asking Jesus to change your life. I'm asking Jesus to help people. If you were here last Sunday, I think God heard us a little bit. I mean, I'm not going to stand here and take any kind of credit, but I'm I'm just going to suggest that God heard us a little bit, that the winds died and the waves weren't quite as big. That just, I'm just suggesting. If you think that's nonsense, it's too late. I've already written in my journal. Thank you, Jesus, for sparing lives. Thank you, Lord, for turning the other one that way. And now there's Marvin and something out there, and I'm praying. We're the people that, if we have faith in God, we speak to mountains. We're that people. Speak to mountains. Believe we receive whatever we've prayed for. I've said it before. If you really believe that what you've prayed, you've received, how would you feel? I mean, if, if, if you believed God heard, answered your prayers, and though you don't see it, it's yours... How would you feel? Woo! Thank God for this glorious day. Thank God I'm not in that mess no more. Well, it looks to me like you're still in a mess. Yeah, but I've already prayed. Don't you remember Jesus stood at the tomb and said, Father, we've already prayed. I already know what you're going to do with Lazarus, but so that they'll know, I'll go ahead and say it again. <laughs> are, are you in the room? Just stand with me this morning.